when I say all those passion and compete leadership skills, that's, that's learned. And I believe that leadership, that's a skill. And that's a skill that we look for. Um, if I, if I'm sitting there at the draft table and there's a kid that's got a YouTube video and he can do all this and do all that. And the other guy's got good skill, but he's an ultra captain leader. Tell you right now, which way I'm going, I'm going to the left side because at the end of the day, it's about winning hockey games and it's winning the Stanley cup. Those other guys might help you get there, but the other guys are going to help you win. That was Tyler Wright, Director of Scouting with the Edmonton Oilers, and you're listening to the Up My Hockey Podcast with Jason Padolan. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games but thought he was destined for a 1,000. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello and welcome back to the first edition of the Up My Hockey podcast for 2021. And after a short break over the holidays, a much needed break for me and for my family, I am recharged, ready to rock and to bring out a ton of new guests and a ton of amazing guests for 2021. And we're going to start the year off right with Tyler Wright. Um, Pardon the pun there. Uh, Tyler is an ex-NHLer himself, over 600 games in the greatest league on the planet. Uh, a 12th overall draft pick to the Edmonton Oilers in 1991, who is now, ironically, uh, the director of amateur scouting for those same Edmonton Oilers. So we get into Tyler's career. We get into what we wish he wishes he would have known then. I get into what I wish I would have known then, why we both do what we do now and why we get excited about it. Uh, and and what Tyler does kind of on a day-to-day basis as being the director of amateur scouting, what that means and how he helps the uh, Edmonton Oilers become the team they want to be now and into the future. So this is a really insightful episode. Tyler has a lot of great takeaways from his career. You know, at, at one point, like I already mentioned, he was the 12th overall uh, selection in 1991. You know, that title comes with, a lot of pressure and a lot of expectations and a lot of ideas you know from the organization and also from the player meaning Tyler about what the future looks like and the future uh, didn't turn out to be what he wanted it to be and what the Edmonton others probably wanted it to be because although he did score in his first NHL game as he talks about as a as a 19 year old he he spent most of his time in Cape Breton with the Oilers in the AHL and fell out of favor with the uh, with the organizational's decision makers and ended up getting traded uh, for a seventh round draft pick at the age of 23, I believe. So that was a very low point for Tyler to, to go from being a 12th overall selection, somebody who played on two world junior teams, had won a gold, to you know not being able to, to make it in the NHL, to kind of being cast away by the Oilers. He said it was a big dark place for him. and. Uh, Moving to Pittsburgh ended up being a saving grace. We talk about how uh, a decision, or not a decision, but uh, a gesture from a coach uh, made the biggest impact on his career while he was there. Uh, And also how he turned the corner and and used character uh, and, you know, professionalism uh, to help him get another opportunity as a player uh, and grow a 600-game NHL career talk a lot about the Oilers you know what he's trying to do with the Oilers what it takes to get noticed as a player what scouts look for uh, how important character is on the radar uh, not only with the Oilers but all teams and some it's a drum that I've been beating for a while now and I'm I'm not going to stop beating it because I I I think everyone needs to really understand and embrace this that uh, that character is a skill and it's something that people want it's something that people are looking for it's something that organizationals, organizations want to have as much depth as they can with. 
Um, so Tyler actually even says, I think that exact, that, that exact phrase in this interview, he says, character is a skill. Leadership is a skill. Uh, these are things we can learn if we apply intention to them. And so this episode is, is great. You know, you're hearing from a, from a guy who makes decisions on draft day about, uh, you know, where, where players are being taken. He has been scouting, uh, ta talent and character and the combination of both for well over a decade now. Uh, he's been he's been around hockey his entire life, and I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from Tyler's story. So, thank you so much for being with us here again in 2020 uh, or in 2021. Back with the Up My Hockey podcast, uh, I look forward to offering some great interviews and some great insights throughout the rest of the year. And without further ado, I bring you the director of scouting with the Edmonton Oilers, Mr. Tyler Wright. All right, welcome back to the first podcast episode here of 2021. Uh, I got Tyler Wright, Director of Amateur Scouting, on the line. Writer, thanks so much for joining us here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hope it's a better year. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Uh, I definitely want to get into the scouting aspect because that's obviously a huge monkey wrench in what you guys are doing and, and you know, trying to do right now with, with this upcoming draft. But uh I want to go back because you're a hell of a player yourself. And, you know, a lot of people that are, are listening here are young athletes or parents of young athletes that are, you know, trying to trying to make a career to this and try and make a go. And uh, one of the interesting things I find on this podcast and interviewing these guys is that everyone has a different way, right, of getting there. Um, some guys were stars in minor hockey. Some guys weren't. You know, some guys grinded their way into the show. Some guys... Uh, had had other had other directions, and uh, you know, looking at your at your the back of your hockey card, you know, being the twelfth overall back in, uh, geez, what year was that again? Ninety one. Ninety one. So twelfth overall in ninety one. That was the year Eric Lindros went first overall. Um, obviously, a huge accolade there to be recognized in that. What what type of a player? Or what was your you know e experience like with minor hockey system there back coming from where was it? Canmore? No, not. Um, yeah. Cam Sack, Saskatchewan. Uh, Cam Sack, Saskatchewan. Yeah. So, what was yeah. what was life like for you growing up there playing hockey? You know, it's it's. A, I mean, obviously, it's a lot of time has gone and things have changed drastically. I think through through minor hockey, but I think the way that you know I grew up, um, you know, my my mom and dad are from a small town called Calvington, Saskatchewan, which my grandparents were from, and it's about an hour from Cam Sack. But it's kind of it's home to Wendell Clark and Kelly Chase and um, you know the kosher boys and you know like you're getting you're getting NHL players come from these small communities and I think that part of the reason that we were able to have the success we were because we believed because there were other people that were coming from our from our communities and you know there was no there was no politics back then. You know I mean? If you were a good player, you were a good player. If you were a 10 year old and the Bantam team needed a player, uh, you know, to play as a 14 year old, you went up and helped the Bantam team. And, uh, you know I mean? If, if you're an Adam and you played Pee Wee and you could play Bantam and like, it was just this community where, you know, we're trying to promote winning. Winning was a big thing, obviously, you know, you, the provincials and in, in minor hockey and, um, you know, we had population probably 1,500 people. We had two indoor rinks. Um, one was natural ice. Uh, the other one was artificial ice. But there wasn't six o'clock wake-up calls to go in your half ice of hockey, you know, a sheet of this and, you know, stop signs on your back. Like, it's a completely different era back then. But it was the love of the game. I, I mean – we would just play shinny hockey or road hockey outside all day long. And I, I mean, I sound like I'm an old crony by all means, but that, that was our life. You I mean, we, you, you went to school, you, you took your skates, you went to the rink and you played shinny and then you ate a plate of fries at the rink and you had practice from seven till nine and you went home and you did it all over again, but you were on the ice for, you know, three to four hours a day. And um, it wasn't somebody forcing you to do there. It wasn't a dad or a mom, um, you know, telling you you need to stop on the pucks you got to do this or you weren't great or you weren't this it was just it was just it was just our way of life so I mean I think that was a big part of my career and um, you know helping me to be able to 
to put those things into place to be able to get to where I got. In saying that, I mean, there's there's kind of a lot there. You know, one, it seems like every time we have kids on the ice these days, there's a whistle in somebody's mouth and somebody's telling them what to do and, and how to do it. Uh, do you think that there should be maybe a little bit more of a push by those of us who, who are uh, on the whistle to, to give these kids, allow these kids some more free time? Or, or how, how do you think that we can go back there? Or do we need to go back there? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? You know what? It's it's such a, a delicate subject, right? Because, I mean, I think, I think there's more expectations now for young kids to play in the NHL from parents from parents. Um, I don't think the expectations were that maybe 15, 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago for that matter, where you were just playing a game. I think there's more, obviously there's incentive because financially there's, there's a bigger reward now. Um, I don't know what the real answer is, but I think the number one thing, and obviously, and, I mean, I relive my career and my, my, my path and my job and what I do now to the love of the game. You know, like I, the Edmonton Oilers want to draft players that are passionate players, love hockey. The NHL is a grind. You know how much of a grind it is. It's 82 game schedule on a typical year. It's hard to go into Chicago. It's hard to go into um, LA on you know, on a Thursday in January and get, get revved up for it. Uh, but I think that's where you, you put people that are passionate, that are committed, that are competitive, that kind of will people into the fight at times when it's hard. Um, obviously you need to have skill and you need to have all these other components, but um, for me, passion and commitment and compete is, um, is a high priority. And I think that that is developed at an early age um, I think, you know, we can take a 12 year old or a 14 or 15, 16, 18, 20 year old kid for that matter, make him a better skater, make, have a, a better shot. Um, can we make them a little bit more competitive? Probably a little bit, but I think that is installed early on in your lifetime as a young adult or as a young child, you're either ultra competitive, you're just competitive or you lack it. Um, I think there's 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 room for improvement in a little bit of those areas, um, but I think you know that that's a big part, and I think that just comes for the love of the game and the passion of being out there and and not deterring that passion. And I think deterring that passion. I remember taking my son. I I got a 19 year old son right now, and I remember taking him to the hockey, and he had really good skill, and. I said, Tanner, I want you just to work really hard today, really hard. As we're driving to PV here in Vernon or wherever it was, and he's looking out the window and he's like, do you think we can go to McDonald's after? Like, he doesn't want to hear it. You know what I mean? He just wants to go and play the game and then he wants to go to McDonald's. He, he doesn't want to hear his dad talk about working hard. Like if I score three goals and I have two assists, isn't that good enough? You know, so I, I think we've got to, we got to put it, realistic expectations without deterring what really our objective is. And, and I think hockey is a great life sport to put a lot of things into place, whether you become a, a professional or not, it's, it's great life lessons on how to be a good teammate, how to be a leader, how to show commitment. Um, all those little things I think that are important in, in any childhood. Sure. Yeah. That's wild. I, uh, I think it's interesting when you have the conversation because I mean, obviously you can play hockey for you know, just the love of the sport. You want to get out there and you want to play. I think when it becomes maybe a different conversation, you know, with our kids or with the coach, with the kids on our team is when they actually tell you, I want to do, I want to be X or I want to go to this place. Right. And I think that conversation, at least in my mind, can become a little more real then, you know, about like, well, you got to do this or you have to start generating this, you know, like, and then it's on them, and at least that conversation is honest, you know, where they can have that conversation. If at the end of the day, the guy just wants to go eat McDonald's at the end of the day, that's fine. But it's probably not going to equate to him, you know, signing an NHL contract anytime soon. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I think that, you know, when we draft these players, we sit here and we talk about player development. 
And I, I go to these players and I say, you know, I mean, we're going to have player development people talking to you. We're going to do this. We're going to give you absolutely every resource possible in the world to make you an NHL player. But at the end of the day, it's going to be up to you. I mean, we can put you on a diet plan. We can put you on a meal plan. But if you're going to go home and eat a, a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken at 2 in the morning, we're not going to babysit you. You know what I mean? And I think that the player development really is the commitment. And, and that goes into the character. And I think as young kids, it's a lot to put on a kid early because I think if you don't do those things, I think you get kind of left behind. But I think one of the issues that I have is, you know, you, you start making teams and competitive teams and and I don't know what the right word is, but I don't want to say pigeonhole, but I'm going to say pigeonhole. But they, they, they put these kids say, well, you're a defensive defenseman and you're 10 years old. Or, or you're a shutdown guy at, you know, at, at nine years old. Well, that cycle, it continues because you're not playing with the best players because, A, you're probably not on the best team. So now you probably get less ice time and you probably got less, I wouldn't say better coaching because there's, you know, there's good coaches out there. But predominantly, the higher teams would have the better coaching. So that that cyclical cycle works you know from the time he's 10 11 12 13 14 15 and if a kid can't get over that threshold it's a lot to put on a young kid so I I I, I think that we just we put so much emphasis on I think the peewee tournament Quebec is it's a great tournament but it's not the Stanley Cup you know like if you don't make that team the world's not going to end for a kid you know if you don't go in the first round in the Western Hockey League the world's not going to end. You know, there's a lot of players that go that don't even get drafted for that matter yeah. in the Western Hockey League. But there's, I see so much emphasis by parents or organizations that, that take a lot of stock in that. If you're a good player, it's my oper- it's my duty and my responsibility to find you. Whether you're playing in Novosibirsk in Russia, in some tier two less league, I'm going. We're, we're turning every rock. And I think that's what parents should, should know that you always don't have to be on the best team and you don't always have to be in the best program financially, you know, paying $30,000 a year or whatever it is, um, you know, to go to an Academy. I'm not sure if that's the great thing to do or the best thing to do. Obviously they've had some success doing it, but it's not the end of the world either. And I think you have to get creative as, as a parent. And I think you got to get creative as minor hockey to keep those, those kids within your community. And, and how are you going to develop them? And it takes a lot of time and passion and commitment. And, and you mean, I, you mean, you, you look at the world juniors this year, we talked as we were texting that, you know, 20 first round picks first time ever, like still didn't win. Wasn't good enough. You know, the, um, the thing that I just keep hearing in, in the back of my head as I listen to you talk, because I, I, I think it is part of like the hockey culture, right? And the part like the, the culture that's surrounding development right now, like you say, like even at the top level, like when we were playing the NHL, there wasn't all these things around. There wasn't dietitians and there wasn't, you know, skill. There wasn't even skill coaches back when we were there. Right. I mean, it was it was an assistant coach working with you after practice. We, we had a we had a strength guy. But it wasn't as, as there wasn't a sleep coach and there wasn't this and there wasn't that. Right. So the the way I see it now is these kids are coming up in this environment. It starts really young. Right. They're surrounded by it, it, the people that have money. They surround their kids with skill coaches early. They, ha- they have these diet plans. They have their off ice people. They have all these people surrounding them. And then the accountability gets lost to the player, I think. The accountability that's on them, like you're saying, to 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 take take control of this, right? This is on you to become the best player that you want. We're surrounding you with these tools, but I think when it starts that young, that it's kind of spoon fed to them, that it is harder for them to be a professional with it. You know, do, do you do you see that a little bit, or am uh-huh. I way off base? No, I, I agree 100. percent I think we're enablers for, you know, and I've gone through this through minor hockey. I think that. There is a time and a place to be stern. There's a time and a place to have fun. There's a time and a place to develop life lesson skills for that matter. I, to reprimand a player for doing something wrong, that's the nature of our game. Or the, the games would be zero, zero, anywhere you play. 
there's mistakes, continuously mistakes. It's learning from the mistakes and not doing it again. How are you sending that message back to that individual? Whether you're 22 and play in the American Hockey League or the NHL, or you're 12 playing in, in Pee Wee and Vernon, how do you get that message and that development process back into their brains? And I think that's kind of where the art of coaching is might have been lost a little bit is that what a coach would do to you to get you going to what a coach would do to me to get me going could be completely opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think that is the, that's, that's the duty of a coach or the assistant coaches to find out what makes him tick, what makes him go. Some people are just a little bit more mild and more sensitive. Some guys need to be ripped on. I, I think it's not just one collective group and you sit there and say, there's no crying in hockey or whatever. It's, you don't know until you're in that position. And, and you know what, Jason, when I retired in 2007, I became the development coach for the Columbus Blue Jackets. And I think at that time, there was probably, I want to say six, five or six, seven of us throughout the whole National Hockey League. This is 2007. I would have loved to have a guy that was just be able to speak to. You know how it is. I'm in the minors as a 20-year-old playing in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, and I'm think every day I go home, and this is how dated we are. You know, you had the plug-in phones. There were no cell phones. My phone would ring. I would think I'm getting called up to the NHL. You know, I played there as a 19-year-old. I'm thinking I'm going to the NHL. I was such a bad player in Cape Breton. My phone wasn't even plugged in and I didn't even know it. They weren't calling me. <laughs> They're not calling me because I lost all reality of just be a good player in Cape Breton and then you'll get the call. I wanted the call now. And, you know, you really relive your career when you're able to do what I have. So I've been lucky and you I mean, I've gone through every transaction possible, you know, from being traded to bought out to, uh, you know, taking the expansion draft to not getting re-signed, getting your contact, your, you know, your contract opted out on the last year. Like every transaction possible I've gone through and how did I deal with it? I would love to go back and, and, and redo things. If I would have just had a voice of reasoning behind, look, let, you're not going to score 20 goals in one game and have a 20 goal season. Let, let, let's get back to the basics here. And it's about the process. And, you know, you, you learn a lot when you retire, especially being around the people that you are, you know, I've stayed in the business and I've had the luxury of, of working with, with Ken Holland now for the last 10 years. You mean you, you learn something every single day. I've been in the national hockey league for 30 years as a player and, you know, on, on the other side of it. And it's amazing how it continue changes and you have to adapt. And I don't think it's anything different really at the minor hockey league level. It's just on a, on a smaller scale. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you covered a lot, a lot of ground there. I mean, I, I, I agree with, with some of those points. I mean, especially you talking about someone to talk to, like, what I do now, writer, like what I what I've gotten into here for the last two years now is, you know, being that voice and not being an agent, you know, not being not being someone in that realm, but just someone that's there for them to give them the best insight possible to to give them the best mindset tools possible to deal with the self that we're talking about, because the skills, the physical skills are such a focus, right? Right now, I, I think more than ever, right? Like how fast can you skate? What do you, what, what, how many, how many things have you thrown on the ice for your skills camp? You know, that you have to go around and, and, uh, and all this stuff yet people are losing the fact of like the relationship side of it, right? Like how, how to be a good teammate, how to, how to, how to recognize that this coach makes a difference for you, how to establish those relationships, how to, how to be able to focus, how to be able to handle adversity and anxiety. Like those things, you need someone to talk to through those things. It just has your best interest at heart, you know, and, and that has that trust. And I think that was something for me as a player, my gosh, I wish I had, you know, because I didn't feel there was, and maybe that was on me, but I didn't ever feel that there was trust 
from the player to coach side, you know, I always felt like I was the guy kind of on the outside looking in and, and there was really no one else back in there. There was no skill guy. There was no whatever. So it was, you were sort of one versus a lot. It felt to me like all the time, you know, and, and as you said, I mean, at 20 years old, you have no flipping clue what you're, yeah. what you're doing, what needs to be done, you know? And, uh, and yeah, well, so I just think that's do. a valuable thing. You think you do. Yeah. You, you think, think you do. You think you do. You think right. you do. You know, we all think, we all think that we know so much at an age, you know what I mean? Even for me right now, you know, like when we make the right pick, it's not Tyler Wright making the right pick. It's us as a staff making. When we make the wrong pick, it's not, oh God, my, my, my Quebec guy or my Finnish guy or whatever like that. You I mean, mm-hmm. you, it's about communication and it's about relationships. And I'll tell you a good story it was actually Dave King. When I, I got, I went to Columbus in the expansion draft and well, first of all, I'll rewind it a little bit if I can. No, I'd and, love to. Yeah, I want to get back to even your draft, your draft year, uh, and that experience in Swift. But you go wherever you want to. Well, I'll save that point. I'll save that point. If you want to go back a little bit further, we we can go that. But I'll I'll bring up a good point that's gonna really kind of resonate on on what we're talking there. Yeah, rock and roll, do it. So in 1999, I have, I got traded to Pittsburgh. I was floundering around in Edmonton. I needed a change, basically traded for like a seventh round pick. Um, You know, we all know what seventh round, obviously it's a pick, but the odds of making it with a seventh round pick, long story short, couldn't make Edmonton. I'm thinking in their high, in their kind of, now I get traded to a team in Pittsburgh. They got Mario Lemieux, you got Ron Francis, you got Thomas Sandstrom, you got Yarmer Yager. I'm like, holy Christ, how how am I going to make this team? You mean, Kevin Constantine was the coach, implemented a plan, and it was defensive, and it was like, God, I, I I, never even went over the red line. I was just, when I was on the ice, don't get scored on. Don't get scored on. So you neglect every part of your game. I'm playing in the NHL. If you look at my hockey card, I played 61 games that year. I had zero goals, zero assists. I average ice time was about three minutes of ice per game. Now, that, that instills a lot of confidence in you. That, I mean, you're just... You're raging full of confidence. Chris, I didn't even want the puck in the neutral zone, never mind in a scoring area. So long story short, the following year, oh, we need somebody better from for your fourth line. We need somebody more offense. We, you know, they're always looking for somebody better. They put me down in the American Hockey League. Kevin Constantine got got relieved of his duties in December of 2000 and or 1999 or whatever. A guy named Herb Brooks took over in turn i'm playing down in wilkesbury um i'm probably i think i'm about 25 years old i just had my first child things have really kind of said you know really hit home now as far as you've got to make a living you got to support you know a family here like this isn't about up and down like this might be going to europe like what what are you going to do with your life and i remember december 18th we were playing at home with Albany and Herb Brooks came down into the, down to Wilkesbury. And he said, pack your bags. You're going to be up for the rest of the year. I'm like, I'm in the minors right now. How, how am I going up? I've got off to a good start in Wilkesbury. I was the captain of the team. And I went back to my wife, my family, my parents were coming in at Wilkesbury. We changed all these things. I said, I've never had anybody tell me I'm up for the rest of the year. It was always go to the rink every day and God just hope you sit there and you pray that your name tag's still in your locker. You know how that feeling is. Like it's, it's the most sickening feeling in the world. And I was like, wow, I'm up for the rest of the year. Long story short, Pods, from January 1 to that year, I scored 12 goals in the NHL from that, from that time on. And every day I went to the rink, Herb Brooks would say, just like you were in Speedy Creek and Swift Current, just like you were in Speedy Creek. I want you to play just like you were in Speedy Creek. Fast forward this, you know, to about 2010. I'm retired. I'm gone. Herb Brooks is, you know, he, he was killed in a car accident, unfortunately. And, you know, we, we move on. And Craig Patrick had come in. Craig Patrick was a general manager in Pittsburgh at the time when I was there. He had come on to Columbus in an advisory role, and I'm running the draft for Columbus. And I said to, to Craig, we we're having a beer one night. And I said, Craig, you know, 
Herb Brooks was probably the most influential person in my career because he installed confidence in me. He believed in me and gave me an opportunity. I went from having zero goals and zero game assists in 61 games a year before. And I scored 12 goals in what, 45 games the next year, just because I got an opportunity to play. No, it was also because every day I went to the rink, he made me think and relive my junior career where I scored, you know, 41 and 51 in my draft year. He made me believe that he knew that. And Craig Patrick said, Tyler, you know what the best part of this story is? He was Herb Brooks never seen you play. He didn't know anything really about you. He did his due diligence and he went back and he talked to people and you were this type of player and you were this type of player. And he knew that there was something in there. How was he going to get it out? By just saying every day, he would say, just like Speedy Creek. That's all it was. He'd walk by me. He wouldn't even stop and talk to me. Just like Speedy Creek. And he'd wait and he'd keep <laughs> going on. And you know what? Like, it's funny, but I think that's the art that we kind of we kind of miss right now. He found a way to instill confidence in me, to me believe that he believes in me. Yeah. And and that went on. I went on to play, you know, what, eight more, nine more years in, in the NHL in a, in a pretty prominent role. But if it wasn't for that point in time in my career, that was the defining time in my career. And, it, you know, I mean, it would have been nice for me to be able to go back and, and say that to him um, because, I mean, he in the NHL, it's been it's been one of the most humbling experiences that I've gone through. And I tell that story to our kids, our, our draft eligible guys. I tell that, you I mean, your career, you're going to come to the NHL and take one of those guys' jobs. There's 700 guys in the NHL or 730 guys in the NHL. They all got families, majority in this. They're not letting you take that job. You're going to have to take one of those person's job. And then guess what? The cycle starts for you. Every year you come to camp, somebody's trying to take your job. And when they do, that's going to be the length of your career. That's that's how you play in the NHL. How can you prolong that line for you as a player? Complacency can't set in. It's got to be, be committed, passion. Every year, we're not waiting around for players to come around and say, we're waiting for you to play. We're waiting for you to play. You may get more interviews if you're a first-round pick. If there's a fifth-round pick that's doing it, we're going with the fifth. We're not waiting. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, that with you. I know, but that's such a powerful story. I mean, the power of coaching, really, right? And the power of having somebody in your corner, like even getting back to what I was talking about before, like it, it obviously helps us the guy behind the bench 100%, but like having just somebody that believes, you know, that has that has an influence that can instill that in you when the time gets tough, because, I mean, you can speak to it better than anyone. I mean, I was a 31st overall pick and I kind of felt you know, looking back again, you reflect and you do these things, boy, there's, there's things I wish I would have done differently. I, I knew I could have been a better, better player or played a bigger role in the NHL. Didn't happen. Right. Because for a lot of reasons, most on me, but I like what you just said there, like that makes me smile so big because to have somebody at the NHL level to do that and to be like, Jace, let's do this. Just like, you know, like, just like the chiefs are like, you know, you're going to be here all year. Like to have a little bit of that security, I think would open me up inside like and allowed myself to believe that I was supposed to be there uh, and for you to hear that I can imagine how powerful that was for you but I mean for the guys where I want to go at this is you were 12th overall man you were the deemed the 12th best 18 year old in the world and you had a hell of a hard time breaking in like the thing is it's it's a hard thing to do you know it's yeah. a hard thing to do and um what do you think that was like so from going from that kid that scored 50 goals from going to that kid that was on two world junior teams um which i wanted to cover too but like to being now in cape breton in the middle of effing nowhere you know a million miles away from what seems like the nhl and trying to figure it out like what was that like as a 20 year old well first of all nothing I love Cape Breton. I love Nova Scotia. My daughter lives in Nova Scotia, goes to school. But I, I had two recalls that I never made because I couldn't get there in time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're in a basically a different country. You're four t time zones away or four and a half hours or whatever the time change is. The thing that goes back to me and, and, and pods, when you, when you look at the NHL and you look at the players that finally make it, you look 
the, whether you went 12th overall and you scored 91 points in your draft year, 41 goals, I wasn't good enough to play on a top two line role in the NHL. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough to beat out Yager and Lemieux and all those guys when I went to, to Pittsburgh. So I had to reinvent my game. How, how am I going to contribute to this team if I can't, if you don't play on the power play, you know how it is. You're, <laughs> your points are cut in half. So if you're going to judge your game on goals and assists and you don't play on the power play, well, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I'm just going to tell you right now, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to put up big, big numbers. So how do you, how do you impact the game without being on the score sheet? Well, be a face-off guy. Win every D-zone face-off. Um, be responsible defensively. Um, go to bat. Be a good teammate. Go to bat for your teammates. You know, somebody takes a run. Maybe you have to get, you know, I, I ended up fighting Peter Worrell twice in one game. <clears throat> Not by choice. One was by choice. The second one wasn't by choice. I needed a new helmet the next day because my head had so many Barney rubbles all over it. I couldn't even get my helmet on. But it was about it wasn't about the fight. It was about me sticking up for the teammate. It was trying to find any little advantage that I could to stay in the lineup and just wait, just wait for an opportunity, you know, beg to get on the penalty kill, beg to get on them. When I got on the penalty kill, Al McKinnis is lining up. You got to eat this puck. I mean, you might break your foot, but you've got to do it. All those little things that I tried to do early on, and then I just I wanted just to wait, and hopefully through maybe injury or a coaching opportunity that somebody was going to give me an opportunity for just a little bit more than maybe a five, six, seven, eight minute guy, and that happened with her. You know, I, I ended up playing that year with with Matthew Barnaby and Alexei Morozov. We went into the playoffs that year. We we had a great line. The following year was the expansion draft. I got picked up in the expansion draft and, you know, I went on to play eight more years and, you know, got traded to Anaheim and finished it out. But I bought my time for an opportunity. Was it a little later than I thought? Yeah, but I still waited out. And I'm, and I'm proud of myself for that. I Do I wish I had a better career? I think we all do, but I'm proud of kind of the process on, on, on how it, unveiled itself and what I needed to do and how I how I went about it because I can wake up every day and look at myself in the mirror and say you know what I gave everything I had and if that was no goals and zero assists that year when I played two minutes I tried and I think that's where it goes back to to these kids that you know I mean you're not a defensive defenseman you know I mean I scored all those points in junior to be a, an offensive guy in the NHL I had to relive that. I mean, you look at a guy like we have in Edmonton right now, and then I've worked with a lot in, in Columbus was a guy named Chris Russell. He was a third-round pick out of Medicine Hat. He was a CHL defenseman of the year. He played on the world junior teams. He did that. He's a premier shot blocker now and a shutdown guy in the NHL. And he's proud of that. And I'm proud of what he had. But he had to reinvent his career to be effective. Um I think that's my biggest message is that, you know, if I'm looking for, you know, a third or fourth line guy, I'm looking for a guy with skill, but has the ability to be that shutdown role rather than just be a shutdown role. Because when you're just doing that shutdown role, they're going to always look for somebody else with more offense. How can we improve our team? With, with you saying that, and I couldn't agree more with as far as the, the skill of adaptability, let's call it, right? Because, you know, you're, you, we go back to the, being that 18 year old kid, you know, myself, I could, I could tell you, I was the exact same guy, right. That I was, I was going to score 40 in the NHL is what I thought, you know, like, um, and who knows, maybe, maybe we both could have, right. It, given different opportunities. You never do know that, but, but I think everyone in that junior role thinks that's just going to, that's just going to move on to the next level, right. We're just going to continue to be this guy. Um, how early would you would you say like it would be good for a player to start considering the skill sets 
uh, that maybe they haven't considered, like being really good along the wall or being really good on the PK or working on your face-offs maybe more than you would uh, otherwise to kind of prepare yourself for that leveling up process. Because I think there's only a few players, and you would know much better than me, but like that come up and get given that top six minutes and they're just going to become that player. Most guys have to earn their way into that role. And to earn their way into that role, you have to be good at doing something else. Yeah. No, I mean, you could probably count it on one on, one hand on how many people actually just be given that role. And we're talking the Connor McDavid's and the Sidney Crosby's of the world. You mean, Leon Dreisaitl won the Hart Trophy last year. I mean, he spent time in the American Hockey League. I'm not saying he didn't have an easy path, but he still had to work for it at times. You know, Pavel Datsuk comes into Detroit. He's on the third line. Like, they they have to they have to buy into the process of the way that you want to win. And at what age, you know, it's a great question because you need structure. Um, but you can always teach structure. Yeah. You know, I think you can't always teach, you can't go down and, and, and go to the local sporting goods store and pick up hockey sense and skill um, I think you can go down and pick up some structure by, you know, a month or two or whatever it is by just doing homework. It's, it's, it's basic schoolwork for you to do, to put structure in place and, and to be able to think the game. So it, it is a really fine line for me. I think you have to have some form of structure, but I think that you have to, I don't, I mean, if you're an offensive defenseman and you want to go with the puck for a coach to say, don't go with the puck. There's times in the game, if it's 3-2 and there's three minutes left to go in the game, there's your structure. But don't don't take away from what makes that kid special, I think, is right. what, what the big thing is. And, and if you're not special yet, get to special. And how are you going to get to special? You know, you I might be a way better skater than you, but you may have a way better shot. Well, because you work on your shot nonstop, and maybe I work on my skating. We've got to reverse the roles. It's not everybody going out and doing the same, the same skill set. It, it's about, you know, I think Sweden does a tremendous job. I, I've dug deep into the academies and, and the, and the minor hockey system on how they, they start out, you know, at say HV 71, which is an SHL team. And they start, you know, in their, in their programs and they, and they go through school and they work their way up into the junior U18 to the U20. And then they go, you know, hopefully to, to play for HV 71, the men's team. But until your skating is at a certain level, you can't go to the next level until your skill set's not at. So my skill set and your skill set are, are, are different. And we're going to put more emphasis on your skating and my, and my puck skills to get to those levels. And I think you look, you watch the world juniors, you see all those Swedes, they look the same. They skate the same. They look the same. They, they got sense, they got skill, they got some are smaller, some are bigger, but but they all look fairly similar. They're, I mean, when you really break it down, they're they're obviously different players, but their skill sets look the same. And that starts at an early age. And I think they've done a tremendous job by doing that. Right. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned when I was saying like maybe these these players work work on some of these intangibles, like and you use the, the example of an offensive defenseman. I, I, I wasn't necessarily saying like, no, now make that guy stay back. But let, let's just say usually that offensive defenseman at a, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old uh, type scenario, probably cuts some corners, you know, takes some chances, maybe gets beat in his own end a little bit. You know, like I'm more talking about like having that conversation, like you got to be gritty defensively, you know, when it's a one-on-one -on -one battle in your own end, like, let's start taking more pride in that scenario because that offensive defenseman is going to have a hard time cutting those corners and making those mistakes at the pro level because he's going to be on the bench in, in a hurry. You know, so I guess that's sort of yeah. where I'm, where yeah, I'm going sure. with that. Yeah, yeah, and and you're right because I mean we install that right. We try immediately. It's if you can't defend in the National Hockey League, it's not a development league. You're not going to play. Yeah, yeah unless you're unless you're getting 150 points a, a year or whatever like that, then you 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 turn away. But <laughs> I mean. <laughs> You have to learn how to defend. You, If you cannot defend, you're not going to earn your coach's trust at the National Hockey League level. Um, so I think that, yeah, you mean that needs to be in the structure, you know, in, in your minor hockey. And there's there's different aspects of, 
of defending. You know what I mean? Like it has completely changed from when you and I played, you know, the big six foot five, 240 pound guy that was just going to paint you all over the ice. Well, now there's stick defending, there's feet defending, there's containing, there's, there's eliminating the cycle. Um, there's all these different terminologies on, on how we, how we want to defend at the end of the day, defending is keeping the puck out of your zone. And more importantly, it's having the puck. So if you have the puck, you don't have to defend. So you, you spin it whichever way you want that if you don't have the puck, how do we get it back? Are we going to get it back through physical force? Are we going to get it back through stick checking? Are we going to get it back through speed? Are we going to get it back through system play? How are we going to get the puck back? Because when we have the puck, percentage-wise, you don't have to defend that much. So, you I mean, we could break this down. I think all these things got to be in place, and they're not in place. And I think that's why the Detroit Red Wings have been so good for so long is because – Ken would send those messages to those kids that would go down to the American Hockey League, not give them too much too soon. And maybe it takes you three years. I know they don't want to hear that because I didn't want to hear that. I know you didn't want to hear that. You want to go right into the NHL and play. We all do. Everybody does. My mom and dad do. My agent did. You know, like my sister and my brother and my buddies back home. And, you know, why aren't you in the NHL? Well, I can't defend yet. Nobody <laughs> wants to hear that, right. you know. The um, what I think is interesting too, and it's come up on this podcast before, and is why I'm talking about like that leveling up process and start getting good at things that maybe aren't inherently something that you get excited about. Is that where that's where the passion comes in? I think, right? You're talking about passion and guys loving to play. A lot of guys just love to play when they're playing the way they want to play, right? I love hockey when I get to be on the power play and score goals, but I don't love hockey that much when I'm asked to get the fuck out of my own end and go for a change or run someone over or whatever. Right. And all of a sudden the passion isn't quite as high. So like, I think that's an interesting intangible when it comes to that. Like, what are you willing to do for this thing that you call hockey? You know? And I think that's where that really deep passion for the sport and being a hockey player comes through because you're going to be asked to do things that you probably don't like, and you got to find a way to like them. hundred percent. I mean, you can have the best YouTube video going, you can have the whatever when you go into Boston or Philadelphia and it's in game seven and it's 2-1, and Zidane Char is coming down the wall, and you've got to eat this puck knowing a six foot seven, 260-pound guy is coming down on you. That's not sexy because things might not end right for you. But it's, it, it's paying the price and the willingness to do it. And when I say all those passion and compete leadership skills, that's, that's learned. And I believe that leadership, that's a skill. And that's a skill that we look for. Um, if, I, if I'm sitting there at the draft table and there's a kid that's got a YouTube video and he can do all this and do all that, and the other guy's got good skill, but he's an ultra captain leader, I'll tell you right now which way I'm going. I'm going to the left side because at the end of the day, it's about winning hockey games and it's winning the Stanley Cup. Those other guys might help you get there, but the other guys are going to help you win. Thank you so much. Going to take a short break. We are back for 2021. Uh, the list of guests um, that I want uh, to have on, that I that I have already got agreements from to have on, is awesome. My wish list for guests is growing. Uh, I'm dreaming big this year. I, I want to have uh, some really big names on here, some people that I have never met before. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, I want to keep rolling with this momentum. You know, we we ended 2020 off really, really strong. Uh, all the download numbers were picking up. We were climbing up the charts. Uh, as I said earlier, we did take a break, or I took a break. I took a couple of weeks off there at Christmas. I needed it. Uh, that definitely doesn't help the, the podcast, though, right? We got to, those things just keep moving forward with or without you. So I want to get the momentum back. I want to push out one, one a week here. We may be even be getting into the best of 2020. Uh, I think there's some awesome nuggets and takeaways from every episode that I'd like to share with you. So we might get into a couple podcasts a week here on the release in 2021. 
But uh, regardless, I just want to say thank you for tuning back in here again, for uh, being a part of this podcast and a part of its growth and a part of its journey. Uh, the more people we can help and the more people we can impact as far as players, parents, uh, and coaches, the better. So uh, dive right back in here. Take a comfy seat for 2021. It's going to be a great ride. And please continue to do your part with the, uh, with the sharing, with the promoting, with the talking about the, uh, the episodes on social media and amongst your friends and sharing it within your, your hockey circles. Uh, it definitely uh, is something that I am grateful for and I want to continue to grow this, uh, this platform. So thank you so much. And now we'll get back to the interview with Tyler Wright. Yeah, that's, uh, I love hearing that. I mean, I, I want to, I mean, well, let's, let's get into that. I mean, that's, the, the line is so fine. Um, as you know, 730 jobs. Let's not even talk about that. Let's even talk about the American League. I mean, it's hard to earn. It's hard to make a living out of playing hockey. There's a lot of guys doing it and guys, a lot of guys want to do it. And then there's guys like you and there's coaches behind the benches that are trying to craft a team, an ecosystem, a culture of winning. How are we going to do this together? And some people fall in love with talent. I think we all fall in love with talent. But when we start orchestrating and starting assembling a team, we know that we need those guys with backbone, with character, that care about other people other than themselves. And also, I think that that character, that level of character, that level of compete makes your individual skill set better. It's going to push you farther. You're going to continue to grow and develop. How can you talk about the pendulum of that, balancing the, the, the act of talent versus character and when does one outweigh the other i mean i, I know there's got to be discussions where that happens how talent is he is he have so much talent that we have to overlook maybe some of these things or the other way around he has so much character that we have to overlook the fact that you know maybe he's not the best skater right now i i mean you hit the nail right on the head and we have that discussion i've been you know running drafts now and been in the war rooms for the last 14 years and I can't tell you how many times that that conversation has come up, not just yearly. We're talking every meeting, every midterm meeting, every final end of the year meeting for the last 15 years that we talk about it. That's how important it is. And at the end of the day, it's how do you, how do you want your hockey club to look like at the end of the day? Do you want to have a bunch of high flying wingers and skilled and woo and tic tac toeing, or are you just going to get results? And I have the philosophy that I am a true believer that the people that exceed expectations, you know, you see a guy, I drafted a guy named Josh Anderson in the fourth round in Columbus. He's now in, he's in, got traded to Montreal scored 30 goals or whatever like that one year. I never thought in my wildest dreams Josh Anderson would score 30 goals. Never in my wildest dream. He's a great hockey player. I probably shouldn't even be talking about him. But at the end of the day is what he did on how he stuck up for his teammates. He was big. He could shoot. He played the right way. Those people that exceed expectations are the ones that have the heart and the will and the compete and the passion for the game that – just, you know, they just will their way around the ice on a daily basis and they never go away. They never go away. And when it gets, when it's tough, they stand up to the challenge and they bring everybody else on their back. And, and the other guys, you know, it might be easy just to go and pack my tent and say, you know what, we didn't make the playoffs this year. Oh, we'll come back next year. You know, like you got to separate those mentalities and, when you do have to look the other way because the skill set and the sense and is, is so extreme, you hope that your culture that you have built is going to pull this guy into that culture to be able to buy into what you're trying to do. And uh, so I think you can have those players, but you better have a pretty good foundation. That's going to be able to, to monitor to, to that and it's not just coaches that are going to do that it's going to be players in that locker room um you know you you look at the intangibles that you know like a guy like mark messier going into new jersey in game seven saying that we will win like and then he backs it up like i mean no one else is going to say that but he's mark messier and he can because you know what people believe it so you find those people those jonathan tate types players around that 
they just will their way around and we're all looking for them. All right. And those guys, I was going to say, like, those are the, I mean, those are the iconic figures, right? I mean, like the Sidney Crosby's is, is one that comes to mind, the Jonathan Taze, where you have this top tier talent that is combined with top tier character and compete. And now you've got something that's just ridiculous, you know? And, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and that's and that's where I think it's special because I mean, I don't know, like a guy from our era, and I never played with him, and I shouldn't even speak to this, but a, a guy, a guy that like an, a Mogilny or like a Kovalev. I'm, I apologize that they're both Russians. I don't mean to put it that way, but they high, high, high skill set. But it seemed like they weren't always willing to compete or go that extra kind of mile, you know. And everyone wanted them on their team because they were amazingly good. But I don't know if you'd want that to be the kingpin of your organization because of the example they're probably sending on a day-to-day basis in the locker room or in practice or whatever might not be once you want these other younger guys to see well i played i played with alexi kovalev in pittsburgh and and arguably within the top three most skilled players that i've ever played with and you know i'm yeah i played with some good players like lemieux and yager and francis and solani and you know some good players like this guy was an elite talent you know, he had a good career, but I don't know if he won. I'm not sure. Like we measure ourselves on 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 winning. I, I mean, we talk about. All right, or hold on, I'm gonna cut you off. Could, could he? Could, like, how good could he? Like, so am I right? I never played. I didn't know him. Like, could he have been? Like, if he would have bought in more to whatever it was, like the the aspect of being a a, a pro or like being trying to be like a Brenda Moore in the locker room, like could that guy just have torn the world apart? It seems like he could. Have. Anyone I talked to sounds like he just had this oh, level I mean, of skill. His his skill his skill set is incredible, and we're talking a physically imposing guy. Like, you know, I mean, I, I don't know how tall he was, six one maybe or something like that, but two hundred and twenty pounds of just pure muscle like oh my god like we we do a battle drill on three on three down low like he'd keep the puck for nine hours nobody could take the puck around I, like when i say nobody nobody could take the puck away from him it was unreal how good he was unreal like it when he scary. wanted to be right yeah yeah when, when he wanted to be good friend of mine but yeah when he how, wanted how, to be. how would that I mean, he'd go 20 he'd go 20 games without a goal like how, how does that much talent go 20 games without a goal right. or 15, yeah. 15 games without a goal? You don't, when you're on the power play, that he get the puck on the half wall on the power play. He could hit that short side. You go back and what it's amazing. If there was a puck that could fit there, he'd put it in. It was ridiculous. When you compare him to somebody like Jagger and, and you know, the, the, you know, the, the stories, the glory stories of Jagger kind of more came out as he got older. Um, you know, in his career, like his, his, his approach to practice and what he would do afterwards and having the keys to the arena and, and all this craziness, the ankle weights. And yeah, I mean, like, gosh, it goes on and on and on. What, what I heard about this guy playing into his forties. Did you see that in him as a young man? Like you, you played with him in his prime. I saw 25 years old. Was his work ethic like that at that time as well? Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. Like, <laughs> like just a freak of nature. Like, you know, I I remember, I, I don't know exactly, but I think it was probably like in 97 or so. I think he's, I think he came over in 91. It was like seven years or so into his career. And like the late nineties there, I think he was probably the best player in the game at the time. I think he scored in Boston and he, he came back to the bench and it was like his first time he scored a, a goal on a slap with a slap shot, like eight years into his career when you're the best player, like, This guy, you know, he's 250 pounds with a stick so long, like you could not defend. There was one, there were two players I remember, and I I use this analogy when I go into our scouting meetings. Um, We'd go into Boston and Yager would say he hated to play against Hal Gill. Wasn't because Hal Gill was, Hal Gill had a great career in the whole nine but Hal Gill was an imposing man, six, what, seven, six, yeah, six, six, seven, six whatever. Seven. His his reach was, you know, his wingspan was whatever. And it was probably weight-wise, he could combat against Jogger because he would use and, put, and protect the puck as good as I've ever seen anybody in the game do it. And, you know, it's Hal Gill, like trying to neutralize one of the best players. Like, 
you I mean when we sit here and we talk about different people in the world and say, you know, I mean, people say yeah, how Gil played in the NHL, the, the best player in the world hated to play against a guy like that, you know. So th- there, there's a good example of how Gil found a way to make himself useful. You know, Zdeno Char was a young kid coming into the Islanders program, and he was the same way right away on Yager, same way. And, you know, so, you know, kind of going off a little bit here about the Yager, but when he – he would work at his trade nonstop. You know, I mean, we would – two in the morning, we'd hear it practice the next day. He, You know, he was there, and his shit would be all over the place, and – you know, people are like, well, what was Ali Ox was in at two in the morning practicing him on his own? And that that had gone on for a long, long time. But he worked so you, at his crap. He worked right. at his crap. And then like that's one of like those those stories I find intriguing because I mean you say um well getting back to talent, right? Like talent, you're a natural, right? Like we, we want to put these 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 players or some of these players in this position that they're just they're just naturally better than everybody else, right? It almost like it, it, it leaves us of the responsibility of taking ownership of our development, you know? And you hear a guy like Gagger, who's obviously he had he had talent and probably world-class talent, but to get to the level that he was at, he had world-class commitment, right? And world-class passion. And that's the stuff that gets me fired up now that I wish that I would have, you know, embraced that or had that example or like was, you know, come on, kid, let's go do this. Cause like, I think now I exude that more probably in my life as a 44 year old man than I did as a 22 year old. Like we worked hard. Like, don't get me wrong, but it's not to the level of probably we should have right. To be the players that we could have become. hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I, that goes back to the culture, you, you know, like you, once you have that culture, like people say, well, let, let's do a rebuild. Let's do a rebuild. Oh, we'll rebuild for two to three years. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. A lot of things have to happen in the rebuild. A, you got to get lucky in the draft. You got to, you you know, injury and all this other stuff. But it, it's the history and it's the culture and it's, it's the willingness not to let your fans down. It's the willingness not to let your owner down. It's the willingness not to let your teammates down. And a lot of times you got to go through a lot of growing pains to be able to get there. And you have to stick with those people that, so once you have that culture in place and you see people trying to hang on and hang on, you don't want to lose that culture because when you lose that culture, it's decades, decades of things going right to be able to create that culture of winning. And that there's a difference between a culture of getting into the playoffs. And there's a culture of, you know, we, we got into the play-ins last year. We lost to Chicago. Our group has to learn from that adversity and build on that to come into this year. Not just satisfied with it. And that's going to be within the players and the coaching staff and obviously come down from, from Ken Holland. But it's not okay to lose. It's not okay to win. Not just for us and our families. We have a lot of responsibility to our to our, our people out there, our loyal people that pay our tickets, that pay, you know, your salaries, that, that do all that. I mean, I don't know if you saw that comp, the J.J. Watt uh, rant in down in, in text. I mean, I thought it was beautiful because it's the truth. It's the truth. And that's how you create culture is when you have people like that hold people in, accountable and, and in place and that are leading and driving the bus, it's the only way you get better. How important do you uh, – what, what do you think is the importance of having your best player be your best character player as well? Um, I mean, I think by default that when we're talking elite players, I think they they have to lead by example. Um, I mean, it would be really hard for Tyler Wright in the prime of his career to go into their locker room – and tell Yarmer Yager or Merrill Lemieux that they gotta they gotta do this, they gotta do that. It's not gonna happen. You know how it is. Mm-hmm. So I think if you look back, and you know, when we were in Detroit, we we always talked about the Steve Eiserman effect. And you know, I think he had 120 points and he did all this stuff. Well, it was okay for him to have 92 points and not win the scoring race, but start winning. And you know, they talk about how he he 
matured into that young man and into that leader and into that captain and it's continued on for his legacy. Um, I think that's a vital, vital part of the Detroit Red Wings from 91 or 93 or, or 94, whatever it was to 2015 that they went to 25 years of, of being in the playoffs for, for that long. Like that cycle continued from Steve Eiserman to Nick Lidstrom, Nick Lidstrom to Henrik Zetterberg. And, you know, they're trying to get that culture back now through with their young kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I think Boston, I mean, there's, there's some organizations that definitely have it done dialed, right. You know, and I know obviously you're, you're, you're with the Oilers right now and you have an amazing star there in Connor McDavid. And it seems by all accounts that he's a real character guy too. And a, I mean, an amazing piece, probably the best piece in the NHL to build around. Uh, but when you got those older guys too, that have been around him, like Steve, Steve Eiserman was, like you said, was one of those guys. He was a premier talent, young in his career. He was scoring a ton of points, but hadn't really learned how to lead, let's say it, or how to win. Like, I think those two kind of go hand in hand. And once he started to evolve, Alex Ovechkin, I think, was kind of on a similar path, right? Like, he was an individual player, had individual success, couldn't get over the hump playoff-wise. And that year they won, he was a different player watching him in the playoffs. He finally decided, it looked like, to to take his own personal game to make it more dynamic, more, more robust, more... Uh, all around to be a 200 foot player and everyone else followed and look what happens. Right. So I think that there is a, an evolution there that can happen. And the quicker it can happen for these guys is, is part of the culture that you're talking about. I think, you know, like the, the more you're around these guys and seeing what it takes, um, the quicker you can become that instead of trying to figure it out on your own. Yeah. You mean it's a hundred percent, exactly what you said. You mean, you look at Steve Eiserman late in his career, he's skating on one leg. You know what I mean? Like everybody knew it but he's still out there. Like he, you mean, you're sitting there, you mean, you got a bang up finger or you got a banged up shoulder or sore back or whatever. And all you have to do is look down the hallway and see, Oh my God, this guy can barely skate right now. And he's our captain. And he's a hall of famer and he's out there doing it. I'm not going into the lock into the trainer's room saying, I got a, I can't play today. I got a bad, I got a sprain thumb or I got whatever like this. You mean all that little intangibles that nobody sees that builds your culture. That builds your 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 willingness to do whatever it takes for the team to win, and it's special. I, I, I mean, it's one thing in my lifetime that I, I mean, I've never won the Stanley Cup. I've been here thirty years trying to do it, and as a player, I mean, that's the most special thing that you can do at that level. Um, it's one regret that I wish I would have had the opportunity to be a part of something like that as, as everybody that plays it never wins, but you I mean, you're still chasing that dream and that's how hard it is to win. The, 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 the effect of mentorship and, and culture and, you know, having a role model, I, I think can't be understated. And, you know, I, I think when I see a kid like, let's say Eichel, Right. Who, you know, I interviewed David Quinn the other day and David Quinn will beat his chest for Eichel as far as his passion and his compete and somebody who wants to win. You get put in an environment where maybe you don't have those elder statesmen there, you know, to show you like uh, like you mean like a Crosby did. You know, Crosby comes in, talk it's in the locker room, Lemieux in the locker room. There's these guys that he could learn from in that environment as instead of being the guy like Eichel essentially was. And even like Connor, you know, like so Connor doesn't really have the the older guys that have been through it, like a Steve Eisman to look up to or a, or a Lidstrom or whatever, right. He's kind of creating the culture on his own. Um, I, I just, sometimes, I mean, that road to figure it out is a little bit longer for obvious reasons, right? Because you don't have that daily reminder of what it looks like to be a true pro that knows how, what it takes to win. A hundred percent. And, and it's, it's, it's trial and error and ultimately it takes time and people yeah. don't, people don't, want time all they can see is is the defeat or um the morale the low morale like you have to learn how to win you have to learn and that process of learning how to win a lot of time there has to be failure and when you fail how are we not going to fail again and when you do fail again you mean it's just taken step by step by step do you have to fail once do you have to fail three times I mean, there's no recipe for success or you and I wouldn't be sitting here on this call right now. You know, we'd be down in Hawaii playing golf every single day with handing out our formulas. Like it, 
it's about having the right pieces of the puzzle and having those puzzles wanting wanting to learn. Yeah. Um, your best players have to be accountable and your best players have to drive the bus. I, uh, well, you talk about character too, because they're, they're, even at the pro level, there's guys that are, are comfortable, more comfortable with, you know, like you say, like maybe a first round exit. That was a pretty good year. I got my 30, you know, come back. I got a nice paycheck and playing for another contract. And there's the guys that, that just, they, they can't sleep all summer because of that you know, and, and they want to come back and get better. And I think that's when you, when you insert those pieces that you're talking about and the, and you know, we'll use the word character in air quotes. Uh, like th that's, that's when you start like that, that winning culture, like how do we learn from this? How do we get better? How is, how is this a non-negotiable for this to not happen again? You know? And, yeah. uh, and, and that's an exciting group because there's a different, there's a different feeling in that room. And I mentioned it here before. I mean, I had a brief cup of coffee with, with the, uh, with the Red Wings back kind of in their heyday there when Babs was there and it was at the tail end of their glory days. It was such a different feeling in that locker room through training camp, through the exhibition games. Like it was, it was awesome, right? It was just a different level, a different standard. And everyone was on the same rope, you know, pulling it. And it, uh, it felt different than any other experience I had in the NHL. And I, and I know you've seen it and felt it yourself that there is, you can play in the NHL, but there's way different feelings within that NHL <laughs> about the group you're in or what's happening. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, it's, you know, there's deflating moments. You know I mean, when I was in the expansion team with Columbus, a great story. I love, you know, we're an expansion team. We're out of the playoffs by December. You mean, it's just, we're happy to be in the NHL. We're a bunch of really throwaways, basically, uh, cast-offs for the most part. You know what I mean? We're expendable, I think, is probably the word. Um, but lucky enough to have another chance. And I remember going into Dallas. It was the last game of the season. And I was minus 40 on the year. <laughs> minus 40. Trust me. I was minus 40. Checking centerman on an expansion team. I had a lot of work to do, but I remember going to the face-off circle and Mike Medano comes in and he says, a couple of rough shifts, eh, Ryder? <laughs> you mean, when you talk about on the other end of the spectrum, I was on the other end of the spectrum. He's having fun. They're, they're you know, it's 98, 99 or whatever. I think they won the cup in 99 or whatever it was. Like, they were in a completely different stratosphere than we were at that time. Yeah. And that's where you need and that's where you're trying to get to that's as a player as management as a coach everything you know you're if we're going to rewind writer just for a second because i want to touch on your career i mean like you said you, you already mentioned you got traded for a seventh rounder so from being a 12th overall getting traded for a seventh rounder four years into your pro career like that's and I don't mean to beat you up on it. You were there, but that's a low point. You mean like Edmonton's essentially given up on you. They're giving you away for, for almost nothing. You're, you're coming off of, you know, a few cups of coffee in the NHL. Like where, where, like, where did you find, like, what did, where did you have to go to like in yourself personally to be either like to get yourself up? Like, was that now, like, did you recognize that as being the opportunity? Was that like almost like a fresh start where you felt a little invigorated or were you? No, no, no. no. We're talking no. deep, deep, dark hole. Yeah. Uh, a lot of self-doubt, a lot of uh, question marks, maybe a lot of finger pointing, um, you know, a lot of self-pity, I think. Um, when I really look back at it, you know, and, and I think this is where that mentorship really would have helped is, you know, I'm supposed to be, I think a lot of, I almost want to say to a point where, you were letting people down, yeah. I would say, you know, like, holy Christmas, like, like, where did this come from? All of a sudden, you know, you're, you win a world, you know, you're two world junior teams, you win the gold medal, you're 19 years, you're playing as a 19 year old in the NHL, you score in your first NHL game as a 19 year old. And three years later, I'm just a shell of myself, just trying to survive in any league, in any league. Like, I actually struggled a lot to play in the American Hockey League. I thought the American Hockey League was actually harder to play in than the NHL. And if you can't play in the American Hockey League, how the hell are you supposed to get to the National Hockey League? So there was a lot of self-doubt, a lot of finger-pointing, a lot of 
you know, pity parties, you know, oh, I see this guy going up and this guy going, why couldn't I get this chance? Why couldn't I get that chance? And I really think that for me, the turning point was, you know, I had my daughter, my first child at a fairly young age at, you know, 24, 25 years old. And it really woke me up to, you know what, you got to get your stuff together because it's not just about you now there. I I've got to, I got to provide for, and it, I think it eased me a little bit to be able to go home and not think about getting called up or what I did wrong or what I did great. And then, you know, you're pissed off at the world because you are playing good and you're not getting called up and vice versa. You're playing bad. So you have no chance of getting called up. I just went home and I, I tried to be a dad, you know, I, I had some joy in my life that had some distractions that I didn't have to think about and I think it really put reality into question a little bit, the right reality yeah. and perspective, and perspective. Exactly. Yeah. And for me, I think that was a defining point for me. And um, I mean, everybody's got their tipping point and that was, that was yeah. mine. Well, good for you. I mean, I, kids to me was the biggest, like it was, it was the biggest wake up call to, to grow up and get your SHIT together too. Right. I, I totally agree with that. I don't know what that would have been like for me as a, as an NHL player or a pro player you know in that environment in my young 20s if you know that would have been a whole i don't know if i was mature, mature enough to to be able to handle that responsibility but it might have been an amazing thing to happen for my career too because it would get you more grounded probably more humble more grateful for for all these things and maybe more responsible too right like responsible yeah. to them responsible to yourself um but in saying that i want to i mean I want to shine the light on the fact that you mean you mentioned you were the captain there in in, in Wilkes-Barre. So, I mean, like you're you're feeling not great. Uh, somebody saw leadership qualities in you that you were doing something right there that you you were an example for others, and they wanted you to be that that person. I mean, good good on you for being able to do that. And how did you do that? Yeah, you know, I think it was just the fact that I I bought in at that point in time to saying. I've got to get my career on track here, whether it's going to be in the national hockey league or in, in Wilkes-Barre in the American hockey league, or give myself an opportunity to go to Europe. I've got to financially set up myself for my family. And, and, you know, what I got named captain. It was the first year ever in Wilkes-Barre, their franchise. Um, Kevin Constantine was, was still the coach. I knew that there was going to be zero chance of me playing for him in Pittsburgh. He didn't believe in me. I didn't believe in him. I didn't believe in myself for that matter. So they made me the captain. Um, I remember I got called up in the end of October for a day. They wanted me to go up for a day. Somebody was questionable, so they were going to call me up. I said, take Tommy Kostopoulos or take, take, take one of these young guys. I'm not going up for a day. Like, I've had my I've had my opportunity. I'm not going to be away from my family for a day to sit on the bench and and I said I said no. And I really took a lot of pride in in being the captain of that team and trying to help these young kids. Tommy Kostopoulos was a young kid coming out of junior. You know, I still talk to him to this day. He's actually doing player development for Pittsburgh, but it was a way for me to kind of have some purpose. And, and it was, you know, I was helping him kind of get his career on track and look at, this is what we need to do. This is what I didn't do. And, you know, I'm thinking at 25, my ship has sailed at, at that point in time, really. And, um, you know, it hadn't, but I, I did the right things at the right time. And probably when nobody was watching, but somebody was watching and it gave me another opportunity. And I think that's, you know, it was a big life lesson for me that I try to share with my own kids. Oh man, that's so huge. Like I get goosebumps thinking about that because like it, it wasn't a pity party. You made a decision. We've been talking like the backbone of this conversation has been about character and you showed some, you know, if, 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 if you, if you were there, to, well, you did have a choice though. Cause there's guys that don't make that choice, right? You wouldn't have got that second chance because if you're down there not helping guys out and if you're down there not taking care of your own stuff, there's no way Herb Brooks come down there and says, you know what, you're coming up for the rest of the year. Right. Yeah. So that earned you that next opportunity. You weren't lighting it up in the American league. You were doing okay. It, your off ice stuff in my opinion, listen to you is what earned you that next chance. And I think that's amazing. Yeah. I think, I think it probably, probably did. I, I mean, obviously, I think that year I only played 20 games in Wilkes-Barre. I think I 
I had like five goals and 15 assists or something like that. It wasn't like I, I was lighting up by any means. Um, we started the first, I think, 18 games on the road because our building wasn't ready. So it really gave us an opportunity to kind of come together as a team. And, and you know, I took the responsibility of having a, you know, I was, I think I was one of very few guys that was maybe even married, but had a child at the time. But I had all these young kids kind of around me. And I was like, you know, we were, all right, we're going to have the Halloween party at our house. Mandatory for everybody. Like we were, we took that culture that we were trying to build and it did it. It, it gave me some leadership qualities and, and an opportunity to, to learn and to lead at that level um, that I found valuable throughout my career. I, I went into the national hockey league. I was an assistant captain in the world championships, you know, three late, three years later uh, for team Canada. You know, I was assistant captain in, in Columbus for the six years that I was there. So I took a lot of responsibility or a lot of, a lot of pride in that leadership. And I, I think it did start with, with that, but, I mean, I watched Ron Francis for five years in Pittsburgh do the right thing. He's the best leader I've ever played with. Well, there you go. But, I mean, that's what I'm – and, again, the message to the young kids is that this – like, even if you're thinking of what we're talking about on an individual basis, how can this benefit me? It does, right? Being a good person, a good teammate, doing the right things is going to get you more opportunity on an individual level. People are going to want you to be a part of that – their own ecosystem. Like, they just – there's no, there's no bad side in being a good person, right? I mean, that, that's what it comes down to, right? It's going to benefit you and it benefits others. I mean, like if, if we start talking about that more, I mean, on the younger levels and the minor hockey systems of coaches place emphasis on this, the stuff that I'm doing mentorship, teaching these guys, the values of this, of these things called character is um, my God, it's just so beneficial, whether you're a hockey player, whether you're a, you're, you're a lawyer, whether you're a plumber, whether you're a father, right? I mean, it's just, it, it goes on and on and, um, I know I get psyched up about that because that was the one thing I think again on the reflection side. Not that I, I mean I thought I was a good team and I, I'd do whatever I could to win, but I think I could have actually cared more and had less focus on me, right, and more focus on others would have definitely helped my own personal scenario. Um, and I think a lot of people can probably speak speak that same language. Podsy, can I can you push pause? I got to get my charger for my computer. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Hold on. Can you push pause uh, for a sec? Or not. Actually, I'll or just cut just... it out. Go ahead. I'll write it down. No big deal. Yeah, I'll be right back. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, man. Hey, no, no worries. Um, that was a quick turnaround. You're like a, a quick pit stop there. It was only a minute and a half. Um, I, we, I know we're running. We're going to be running out of time here. Um, I don't want to take up all your day, but there's definitely some stuff I want to cover. And one of which, I mean, we, we haven't, I mean, I wrote on the screen there, director of scouting, but I think for those listening, like if, if, well, I'll ask you, what is it that you do? What does that mean? If you could define the role you have within the Edmonton Oilers, what does Tyler Wright do? Well, I run the draft. Um, so at the end of the day, my responsibility is, is making sure that we're drafting players that we want the Edmonton Oilers to look like in two, three, four, five years from now. And it's taking Ken Holland's philosophy and the way that Ken wants his team to look like and me filtrating that down throughout our scouts across the world. Um, and it just comes back to relationships. Uh, it's about communication. Uh, it's about philosophy differences. At the end of the day, you're going to be right. Sometimes you're going to be wrong. Sometimes uh, we're continuing evolving as, as an organization and as a group. Um, does our philosophy change at times? Um, you know, the way that we want to look and build is different than the way that the Calgary Flames or the Vancouver Canucks, for that matter, or the Winnipeg Jets. We've got pieces of the puzzle already in place. We've got to fill those pieces in. Um, if those pieces of the puzzle get filled in through trade or through free agency, then we've got to circle back and 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 put an emphasis on some of the other more um, prominent pieces. So, the draft for me and the and in the develop the the projection of where the Edmonton Oilers are going to be in you know say two to three four five years from now falls on our shoulders and um, it's exciting. It's hard. It's a thankless job, but it's it's an important job and it's. Uh, it's gratifying at the end of the day too when 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 you hit it. So you 
so to break it down a little bit, so so Ken Ken and you are in close contact. By Ken, I mean Ken Holland. For those listening, so Ken's the GM. So you guys, you, you, there's an overarching philosophy on what the Edmonton Oilers want to be, or can be, or should be. Um, we want to try to generate that, cultivate this type of uh, look through the draft. Now you are talking with your area heads, I guess, is that for lack of a better word, you have scouts that are on the ground responsible for different regions. You, you're, you're talking to them about what, about what you want them to look for. hundred percent. So, you know, whether it's a guy in Russia, a guy in Finland, a guy in Sweden, Quebec, Ontario, you know, Saskatchewan throughout the U S Minnesota, Boston, anywhere, really. I mean, if, if, if we don't have a scout and there's a player in China that, you know, is starting to get some attention, then we'll go to China. You know, like it's um, obviously the draft, there's parameters on the draft as far as, you know, when you can draft these players at what age. Um, but our area guys, you know, responsibility is to, is to identify players that the players that we want to draft. And then it's myself and, um, you know, I'll have some crossover guys that uh, will go to all those areas and, and and see what they're saying um and then have that discussion i either agree or i disagree or i can learn from what he's saying and um you know at the end of the day we have to compo uh, com compose a list of say european players and north american players and then you know uh, you gotta you got all these different pieces of the puzzle coming together to ultimately come down to to one two days of drafting where you only may have five picks. So it's a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of behind the scenes stuff. So when we have say a fifth or a sixth round pick and people, you know, in social media sit here and say, well, the odds are not whatever. We want to be those odds. We, we make every single pick that we have extremely vital to hoping at one point in time that they meet certain requirements that, we require for them to become a part of the organization. And then we have to exploit them once, uh, once we draft them, give them and develop them, give them right. resources, um, patience, all that sort of stuff that we talked to before. So you have, so you have, you have your, your, your area scouts on the ground. The phone rings to you. He says, Hey, I got this guy, uh, you know, in North Dakota, uh do you do you how, how often do you go out there are you are you following i guess the smoke like are your area scouts saying okay here's some smoke and you go see if there's fire like do you have vi your personal eyes on every player that you draft or at some point do you just let the area scouts you know have a consensus on the pick uh great question um i would say as the draft goes on into the later rounds uh, I think it would be arrogant for me to say that I know all of them. Um, I think I probably see a lot of those late guys, maybe by default, if I'm in a certain region, if I'm in Finland watching, um, you know, just we'll take this year, for example, I, Anton Lindell went, I believe, 12 to, to Florida. If I'm in there watching Anton Lindell play in Finland, and by fault, you know, they're playing against somebody else or they're playing on the national team. There's another guy that might be a fifth or sixth round pick. I could get my viewings that way. Um, but at the end of the day, I really rely on my area guys for those later round picks, you know, into that, you know, five, six, seven. I think I would, I would see a lot of them, but at the end of the day, they know them better than I do. So your time and your time, and even like when, when I was interviewing Ken, he was a guest on the show here. He said that he'll definitely see the, you know, he's involved in the first round selection. He'll see the guys that you guys are looking at. Um, and then obviously less so as the farther down the spectrum. So you're, you're putting more resources into your top two, three rounds. And, and I guess just by natural default, right? I mean, you want to make sure you get those picks right. Those are the ones that have a better chance of, of, of coming to fruition than the other guys. Not to say that those later round picks don't ever come to fruition. As we all know, there's a million stories where those guys come and make a big impact. But uh, that's where your resources are really going. Make sure you try not to make a mistake in those first two, three rounds. Yeah, 100%. You mean on a daily basis, you know, talking with Ken, text update, you know, saw a great play. So a really intriguing player play in Halifax or in Prince George or uh, in Yokerit or, you know, so a lot of dialogue, a lot of, you know, and then Ken would go, 
you know, I would say prominently to the the big tournaments, you know, the World Junior tournaments. It's, you know, not a lot of draft eligible players, but there are some. Um, at least the top end guys would be there for the most part. But the under 18 World Championships, um, there's some tournaments in February, U18, Five Nations. There's a Four Nations in November. He might try to get in for the weekend and um, and and see some of that just so he can put kind of a a player to to a to a name. Just on draft day, just to maybe get behind the curtain a little bit. Do you and and I assume everyone has their own philosophy, meaning organizationally how they handle the draft. Like, do you go in there with a list com- co- compiled from like one to let's say 200 like and, and then so you know as these guys go off the board you scratch them off or do you just try and have about 10 to 20 picks in the area that you are drafting uh players you think that are going to be there and then just go from there and then make your call say at, at, as as your name gets called like are you guys making decisions on the floor like that yeah you mean and, and it's quick it's it's really quick obviously the first day uh day one a um, little bit more time frame to work with. Um, I'm not going to give you all my draft secrets, sure. obviously, um, but you know we've got we we prepare for every conceivable sit- situation. I don't know if we're going to trade. We could trade the pick. Um, we could obtain an, another pick. Maybe I'm right. saying a first round pick. Yeah. Um, you know we had no second round pick this year. Uh, we prepare like. We could have one. Do we prepare like we could have two? Um, so we prepare for all those scenarios. Trading back, do we trade back and gain a second round pick? Do we trade back at two second round picks? We we prepare for all that the scenarios. So we we identify. Um, I would say to you, without giving you too much, I know within. I would say probably four or five players going in into day one that we think we could get. Um, and then, you know, we don't just sit there and, and scratch off and say, uh, well, we got a third round pick. So a third round pick, uh, you know, this guy's rate 167. Um, we don't do that because if you get number 14 wrong, 167 is wrong, you know? So right. we, we, we kind of, yeah. we kind of maneuver as, as we go around, you know I mean? If we're going to take a defenseman in the first round, if we're going to take another defenseman in the second round, well, you know, I mean, we play into that. If we're going to take a goalie in the first round or a goalie in the second round, we're probably not going to take a goalie in the third round. You know, right. like yeah. there, there are all these different things that come in, in the, in the play. How I, is love it? I love yeah. it. I love it. You know what? For those two days, it's unreal. Yeah. I like, believe it. So I much could, adrenaline. Hey? I could sit there for a week on end. Guys don't even drink water because you don't want to leave the table to go to the bathroom. So it, it yeah. is, you mean you work your you work 360 days a year year to make this one two days count? Let's make sure we're on we're on point here. So the um, central scouting rankings on your on your pick last year, Holloway had had him as a 12th best skater in North America. You guys end up taking him 14. Now that's not too far off. The the I mean, say the consensus. How hard is it when you see something that maybe other people don't, and maybe you think you got that diamond in the rough, like? Is, is is that a tough one? Because like, there's going to be a lot more questions with that. And I guess it's, uh, you know, faith in you and faith in your team. But have you ever been stuck in those situations where it's like, gosh, how come nobody else sees this? And... Yeah. But I'll tell you, it's a humbling experience because you might think you're right. You We won't know for three to four years if we're right or not. Yeah. And we can go back for however long in drafts and say, wow, how did this guy go 25th overall? Or how did this guy go in the seventh round or the, you know, how did Nick yeah. Lidstrom go in the third round? You know, like, so with social media, you mean you wake up on Sunday and you're like, Oh, draft grades. Like who knows? Like no, we we think we knocked it out of the ballpark, but so does the other 31 teams think that they knocked it out of the ballpark. And then six months later, we're sitting there. Wow. Boy, did we really like this guy that much? Or wow, did we get a steal? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's humbling. So if you want to, if you want to, you know, pat yourself on the back and pump your chest out, you better be prepared to take the lickings because the lickings 
they will come. Sure. So, yeah, no, for sure. You mean what Dylan though, you know, at 14, he was one of those targeted guys that we had at 14 that we thought we could get. And and we did. And I think if you look at the way this world junior played, um, I mean, I think not I think, I know he he oozes a lot of those qualities that that we talked about earlier in the podcast. All right. No, that's awesome. With um with with the with the draft uh, and you you know building up to this draft day, how involved are you then as director of scouting after these picks have been made? Do you, is it almost a handoff then to the director of player development, and are they're responsible for you know getting these guys you know that three four year window that you're talking about, or are you still in there watching these guys and see how they progress? No, it's it is a handoff to a certain extent. Um, you mean. But it's also a collective group as far as um, me making sure that I let our player development guys know that, you know, these are his qual- these are his, his best qualities. These are his deficiencies right now. And now it's your job to help him in those deficiencies and set that game plan and then trust the process but it also goes deeper as far as, you know, going into the pro meetings, into the trade deadline, as far as watching the progression of other drafts, who we did like and who did not, who has not kind of reached their value, who maybe could we get in maybe via trade or via something, uh, talking with the pro guys to sit there and say, you know, there's a kid that's out in LA. We really liked in his draft year. I don't know what has happened from that, but something hasn't been right. Um, maybe we'd be willing to take a chance. This guy fits the bill on, on what we need to do on here. So it, it's constant communication with our pro guys, um, obviously with Ken and our development guys. Um, everybody just kind of add in, you know, if we're looking for a big six foot five defending defenseman, you know, we might look back and say, well, God, there was this guy that, that hasn't gone. So maybe we go out and target him in a, you know, in a trade or try to do our due diligence and go right. and watch him. So it, it's, it's fascinating to be honest with you. And as a player that played, I had zero thought that there was this much work and legwork that went behind the scenes because every transaction is not just off Right. Yeah. <laughs> you mean it's yeah. well thought out. Now, you I mean we're talking millions of dollars as well with salary cap and stuff like that, but um it's uh, it's exciting it's an exciting position. It's a lot of hard work, it's a lot of travel, it's a lot of it's a lot of time away from your family, but it's it's rewarding at the end too. Well, I'm sure you must see a absolute polar opposite of like the investment put into let's say a Dylan Holloway now as 14th overall to a Tyler Wright at 12th overall you know, that you were kind of left to be floundering, like you said, for yourself floundering around in the minors, probably not many people talking to you, not many phone calls, no one working on whatever your deficiencies are, nor communicating to you. And now, you know, these guys do have all these resources around them, you know, with people trying to get the best out of them. So uh, hope they understand that and hope they're grateful for it. Cause you know, there's people that like yourself that obviously would love nothing better than Dylan Holloway to be an amazing player and, and help them to others sooner than later. Yeah. And you know what pods like, when I, when I, my first year of player development was like 2007 and Derek Broussard and, and Jacob Voracek and Derek Dorsett and Chris Russell, all these guys that were in Columbus, I'm still in contact with those guys. It, it's not just becoming, you know, you want to say a mentor. I was a mentor. I was helping, but they appreciate that. I still, you know, Derek Dorsett, who, you know, was out in Vancouver, retired with a, you know, a, a neck injury, you know, when he retired, he, it's a simple text, you know, Hey, thanks writer for, you know, helping me get to where I needed to go. And you know what, that that's as big as a compliment as you can have when you can help somebody achieve something and nobody's watching, nobody knows, you know, Derek Broussard will send me a text or whatever like this. That makes me feel good as a person. When we talk about helping people out and, and, reach those dreams. And, and you're right. I, I wish I had that. I, you know, you wish you had that. Um, it's the game has changed and, and hopefully we can, yeah. 
we can filter this down into our minor hockey systems and and just produce good people. Yeah, and that's not a. I mean, I don't I want the listeners. To know, that's not a whole a poor me thing, and to, and I know writers not saying that either. But it's it's awesome that that's been an inspiration, at least for me, to do that. You know what I mean? Like, there's su it's such a powerful position, like you said. Like I, I smile because I even think of the guys that I'm helping, like and where they've got. Like it's not on me, but it's you're helping right? You're helping. It's on them. They're the ones doing it, but you're helping. And the fact that you're assisting and supporting somebody to become the best player they can be is super gratifying and super rewarding. And I can't think of, you know, a better way to spend, to spend our time, you know? No, exactly. I mean, yeah. we didn't have that opportunity. I mean, it wasn't poor us. That, that's just where the game was. Yeah. The, the, the game wasn't there. The game yeah. has evolved. I mean, they have full meals every day at their rank. Like, God, like it's a, you know what I mean? Like I'd stop at Tim Hortons, get a bagel and cream cheese and go to practice. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. it, the game has completely changed. Oh, uh, for sure. Uh, I, I will. There's a couple of things I want to ask you before we go. Um, just briefly, uh, just because we, we were talking about the process of the draft. Like, what does that look like for you guys this year? You're not able to watch junior kids. You're obviously just at the world junior tournament. Like you said, most of the guys there are already drafted. How are you building your draft list right now? And what does that look like for 2021? Yeah, very complicated. Um, now, having run through it from March, you know, on the pause, say, of March 15th to running that draft, we weren't done evaluating for the – but I would say we probably had about 85% of our work done until that pause there's a tournament in April, a U18 World Championships, which is a huge viewing that we weren't able to see. And then obviously playoffs um, in Europe and playoffs in, in the CHL, no Memorial Cup. So I would say 85% of that was done, but we still did a lot of legwork from, you know, March till, you know, September of going back and watching video. We, we've got three different platforms, um, unreal platforms, to be honest with you, that are loaded within, I would say, 24 hours of a, of a, of, a, of a young man or a kid playing a game to having access of that being broken down to sig significant shifts. Now, Europe has been playing for the most part, Finland and Russia and Sweden. Um, so we've had some live viewings over there with, with our scouts. Um, we've done a lot of video scouting as far as our North American scouts doing European stuff. The Quebec League did start, um, you know, in October and November. So we did not so much live viewings, but we were able to get video. Some colleges have started to play the NDTP program, uh, the U.S. Development Program's playing, uh, the USHL is playing. So we have had some, it's the Ontario and the Western Hockey League that we haven't been able to see any games played, where I think it's probably going to be the most difficult to do that um, until, you know, we're told if they're going to play or not, we're still you know, we're going back and, and watching video. You've seen these kids by default as an underage, if they played as a 16 year old last year, um, or if they were a late birthday as a 17 year old. So there might be a little bit of familiarity with some of them, but it's a challenging time and we're no different than anybody else. So we've, right. we've got to come up with creative, act, you know, scenarios on, on how, how we're going to get to, to seeing this. So, uh, it's going to be an interesting draft. Um, any, any chance it doesn't happen, or is that a zero chance? Fantastic. I, I I wouldn't say it's a zero chance. Obviously, that's above my pay grade, and you know they've already put the draft dates on the schedule for in July. So I would say that I'd be pretty confident that we would be having a draft. Yeah. You know, I think by pushing it back. This is just my own philosophy. By pushing it back, it just creates more and more chaos down the road where I think we just we want to try to get through this pandemic the way that we can, get everybody kind of healthy and get everybody going in the right directions to get fans back and everybody up and playing. And I think that's the goal, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, it'd be interesting to look like twenty what 2022 looks like because it could be uh, you know the highest percentage ever of 19-year-olds getting taken. You know, potentially, I mean, from the outside looking in, right? Because usually that doesn't happen. Like the a few guys will slide through that first year, and then you're you're eligible for two years. And maybe a few guys that might be might be missed this time through. But you know, I guess you do what you do, and, and it'll be uh, it's an imperfect science at best on a good year. I can imagine this year is even it will be even more challenging. But uh, yeah, for sure. Um, last question uh, I have 
Oh, well, I'd love to get into Ron Francis because I, I love talking about great leaders and what he's what he showed you. Well, maybe like what what was just quickly what was amazing about Ron? Like, why would you pick him out of all the people that you could have picked out? They said he was the best leader that you were ever around. Um, you know, it's just his presence. To be honest, you know, I think just the way that he conducted himself in whatever manner it was. Uh, whether we're having a ping pong game or we're having a closed door meeting. When he spoke, people listened. He backed it up, obviously, through a great career. Um, he backed up what he said on the ice. I think, you know, there are different type of leaders. Um, the calming influence, I think, that he had, you mean – Yarmer Yager micromanaged Ron Francis micromanaged Yarmer Yager's career, basically. I mean, he was the guy, the go-to guy that Yags would listen to. And he was the smoother of, you know, he knew how to get Yags going. He knew when to stay away from Yags. He knew when to step in for the coach to when let, you know, Yags go off with the coaches. Um and just the accountability. I mean, everything he did was first class. Um, everything from his wife to, you know, making sure the other wives felt wanted or, you know, welcomed for that matter. He just, just a very classy man on and off the ice. A pro. True pro, eh? Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Um, all right, so well, last one for the kids you're listening to, parents. How, how does a player – go about impressing Tyler Wright? Like what, what do you, like what, what's something that just kind of gets your, get, get you go, your eyes go look like pie plates and, and it gets, gets you excited when you're watching somebody. Well, my eyes look like pie plates regardless whether or not I see anything. <laughs> um, you know what? I think I've really, you know I mean? I think I've, my philosophy has changed too. I think, I mean, obviously I think you, you kind of tend towards go to players that maybe that you thought you played like. Um, I love skill. You need the, all the at the end of the day, the game is scoring goals and winning hockey games. So whether you win that one nothing or seven six, I don't. I don't know. I like to win. I want to win, and you need to score. So obviously, skill and hockey sense are vital. Um, I think the game is as fast as it's ever been, so you have to be able to skate. Uh, and then the third. And final thing would be, I don't care how many points you get in a game. If you don't play with passion and you don't play a competitive game, and that's competitive rated like we talk different, 50-50 puck battles, that's competitive. Win that 50-50 puck battle. Um, you know, stopping on pucks, turning away, flybys you know, dragging, dragging the skate to not go offside rather than just don't go offside. You know, all those little small things that make up a real true pro gets me excited. Um, because you know what, at the end of the day, their learning curve, when you have that installed at a young age, their learning curve is so much faster to get to the NHL level because they're not going to have to go and learn that at the American Hockey League level. They might have to go to the American Hockey League but I'm not saying they have to learn it because when you have to learn that at pro, it's going to take you a long time. And maybe that means another organization as far as getting an opportunity. So we try to get those things in place, you know, at, at junior hockey or whenever we draft these kids, part of the philosophy. So just play hard, play, play with passion, be a good teammate. When we it have, st a it stands out though, doesn't it? Like I don't want to cut you off, but like that, you're talking about compete, like, I can watch an NHL game now in regular season in, you know, in a normal year in middle of January and I can pick out the guys who are like competitive. It's easy, you know, and at the junior level, it just seems like you can stand out being competitive, being hard to play against the 50, 50 battles, whatever that, whatever that is. I think that's a really, it, it's an easier way to get noticed than your skating or your shot. Be yeah. a super competitor, be, be tenacious, right? Like you see that it's easy to see. So I have a, I have a, I have a question that I ask my scouts every meeting that we're at. I'm like, 
Would you rather play with them or would you rather play against them? That's awesome. You know, and for me, if you're going to say you want to play against them, I want the guy that you want to play with because I know the players that I don't want to play. I, you know, I mean, Darcy Tucker. Uh, I mean, I just named these guys. I mean, I'm not saying that they were highly skilled guys in, in junior, you know, Darcy might even be in your age category a little yeah. bit more yeah, than, 75. than mine. He's a little bit older than I'm a little bit older than him, but I knew every time when he was in Tampa and Toronto that, Oh my God, this is going to be an absolute war against this guy again. You know what I mean? Those are the, those are the type of players. It's the competitive guys that will do anything and willing to try to win a hockey game. That's how you win. And those are the guys that we look for at the end of the day. Obviously it's skill and sense and skating, but we want competitive players to win. Yeah. And that's a mindset thing. And that's a decision what you're talking about there. That's every time you go on the ice as a player, you have the choice to be that, you know, and that's what I love about that is because it is a choice. Every time you lace up your skates, you make the decision on how hard you want to compete. You don't have the, you don't have the decision on how much ice time you're going to play. If you're going to play in the power play, what position you play or who you play with, but you have a decision on how hard you want to work tonight. Yeah. I think if we install that with our, with our youth, and I think for the most part, Canadians have over the course of the year, over the years, um, we'll just become better, better hockey players. And ultimately we'll be better people. Yeah. Amen. We'll leave it at that, man. I really appreciate your time. Awesome insights. I, I know a lot of people appreciate it out there. And, and this, again, this is all about the whole reason I do this is to try and, open pull back the curtain if you will right on on what it is that we were talking about as players that we didn't really get that we didn't really understand um saying that we wanted to be pros and be nhlers but not really understand the magnitude of it and just to allow these players at a younger age to kind of get it and trying to build themselves into this player that they're or the person that is required to become the player that they want to be you know and i think that the two go do go hand in hand it's not it's not player centric and it's not person centric but you got to develop your people skills to be an amazing hockey player and that's sort of the 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 uh, drum i've been beating here in the last in the last while and uh i just see it time and time again you know i mean those guys um that get committed committed to being better people uh, and better teammates uh they grow their skill and they become better hockey players. So uh, I know you see that in the scouting there too. So Ryder, thank you so much, man. Um, wish you, wish you the best year with this upcoming season, whatever it is of it. What, uh, what does that look like? I guess in closing, like do you right now, are you, are you watching mostly on game tape or you, you must be home more than you usually are. Yeah, obviously uh, traveling, not too much, just to Edmonton a couple of times, obviously for the draft and free agency and go, uh, going to catch the first four games here in Edmonton uh, to start the season and then hopefully get back onto the road. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we, you know, I mean, it's like anything else. Uh, we have to adapt it somehow. How are we going to knock this draft out of the ballpark? We, we have to worry about what we're doing and our philosophies. We've got to dig deep. Um, nobody wants to be in it, but this is the position that we're in and we're going to have to deal with it. And, Hopefully everybody can stay safe and healthy and the NHL can get off and going and, and, and we get these vaccines out and we can get kind of back to somewhat normalcy. You know what, when you said that, I have to ask one more question. So in a year like this, where you might not be able to see people, how, how much do you depend on the call to the coach or how much do you depend on the, the people that have been around these guys you're interested in on a day-to-day basis? You know, does that now, increase the value of those of those relationships that you've built and those phone calls that you're going to have yeah for sure but you know how it is pods too that you mean you you trust and you and you you earn other people's respect through you know there's different levels of it you mean everybody's trying to tell me that their kid is you know oh he's going to be a great he's great he's great they're trying to sell their program i get it but I mean, you, there's certain people that you have more, you know, you hold their opinions, maybe a little bit more valuable. Um, but we dig, like we dig, we go all the way, maybe not even so much their coach this year. We go back even before, how was this kid as a, uh, you know, a 15 year old playing major midget, um, talk to their coaching, um, talk to, 
you know, trainers, how was he treat, how does he treat people in the locker room? Um, you know, is he a good teammate? Was he just, would he, you know, does he throw his, his, his gear in the, on the, on the ground and expect people to, you know, does he pick up guard? All, all those little things that we try to help us paint this big picture to make the best educated guess, educated guess to turn out at 22 and 23 to be a major vital piece of the Edmonton Oilers. And you mean, you learn something every day. Um, it's intriguing. Um, there are pieces that sometimes you fail. And when you do fail, don't make the same mistake again. All right. Yeah. No, awesome. All right, man. Uh, it's good stuff. I'll cut you off. Uh, we're episode, what was this? 48 now, almost hitting 50. It was awesome to have somebody coming in that does what you do. Cause I know, uh, there's kids out there that want to k- k- attract your attention, right? That's what, yeah. that's what they're doing it for. So awesome just, to share that with us. It doesn't matter where you play. Just play hard, work on your, be committed to the game, work at it. It doesn't come easy. And if, it, you know, it's a cliche. If it was easy, everybody playing the NHL, right? Yeah. You mean? 100%. I hear you, buddy. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Pods. So what a great interview to start, uh, the 2021 podcast campaign with to have on the director of amateur scouting somebody who's making the decisions you know along with mr holland at the at the table there on draft day uh is pretty cool to have his ear for uh over an hour and a half uh about what they look for what the job feels like you know the type of the type of personalities and the type of character people that they want to bring in their organization uh, should send a very, very clear message to all you young players out there and all you parents out there. It's very easy to talk about character. I think it's really easy to potentially say the right thing um, to your athlete, whether you're a coach or whether you're a parent, but how do we demand it and how do we get our athletes to buy into this idea of teamwork of being a great teammate, of having the character to do what needs to be done regardless of whether you want to do it or not. Uh, how do we get that? How do we get there, right? That That is that is one of the problems I have been attempting to solve with my character course. I believe the conversations really matter. I believe when when athletes understand the why, how this applies to them in tangible, practical terms. What does being a good teammate mean? How does my, what is my action? What is my action, my go-to action if I wanna be a good teammate? How do I act in a locker room? How do I act at practice? What things do I need to do to develop my ability to be a better teammate? How do I develop my character to do the hard things when I don't necessarily really feel like doing them? How do I show up every day to be the best player I can be and to chase this dream of becoming an NHLer, let's say? There is a whole lot riding on this skill set called character. And I think that our emphasis on the skill development of the physical attributes of the skating and the stick handling and the shooting, there is so much emphasis on that and that generally isn't the make or break. When you get into these leagues, the midget AAA leagues and the junior, the, the junior A leagues and the Canadian, the Canadian Hockey League, everyone's pretty darn good there. You can make your difference by how you show up in a locker room, how you show up for practice, whether you're prepared or not, whether you're looking out for someone else other than yourself, that gets noticed. Your compete level on the ice gets noticed. Your battle level on the ice gets noticed. That doesn't mean running over people anymore. That means not going away. That means always showing up, being a pain in the butt to play against. These types of intangibles are huge. Now more than ever, Teams are investing millions of dollars in players. They need to believe in the person. And there's ways that we can do that, whether that's through mentorship, uh, whether that's just something like my hockey with the character course, 
whether whether that is finding a role model, somebody who has been there before and getting in their back pocket and asking a million questions and trying to follow in their footsteps. But it is it is an investment that you will never regret. It is an investment you will never be, ah, oh, shucks. I wish I wouldn't have spent so much time working on my leadership, working on how to be a better teammate, working on how to figure out how to get it done in the times when I don't have the energy or I don't have the motivation to do it. Those are never things you'll ever regret. And, uh, and I think we can, as parents and as players, shine a light in those areas of how can I become a valuable person to this organization uh, that I want to be. It's gonna help you as a player. So I love the fact that what we talked about today with Tyler, that was like, that was the backbone of the entire discussion, I think. You know, it was about <laughs> what he learned from when he wasn't good as a pro, why he wasn't good, to what gave him a second opportunity, right? To what, to what people now text him about now is helping him in his career, what makes him feel good about himself, you know, about the value he's provided to society, to the game, uh, was all character stuff. Right? And that's what he's trying to find now when he's at making these phone calls to team trainers, right? He's calling a team trainer from two years ago if he's thinking of drafting you to see how you treated him as a player. Right? What was this guy like? What was he like in the locker room? Did he pick up the trash? Did he want you to pick up his gear for him? Did he take care of himself? Did he treat people right? That's the type of homework that these teams do because they care about what you're like when you're not on the power play scoring three goals in a game. And I think myself as a player, I wish I would have understood the depth of that and even understood more about how all those things away from the rink actually equal you being a better product on the ice. And I think for me as a player, as a young player, right, we gotta remember these guys trying to make it somewhere, we're, we're, they're teenagers, right? Early, early 20s. As Tyler said, we think we have it figured out in that scenario, but we don't, right? We don't have it figured out. And I think the more opportunities we have to have the discussions about the whys, right? Why does investing in your character result in you being a better hockey player? That's a really interesting concept that a lot of these guys haven't understood. Um, and I think the, the more clear we can be, the more different angles we talk about that, uh, the more we're going to get buy-in from the players. So players listening, it matters, right? It totally matters. Uh, it's going to help you in your dedication and your perseverance and your resilience. It's going to help you with how likable you are in the room. It's going to like, it's going to help you with, uh, organizations that want to bring you in because they know that you're going to help somebody else within that locker room. And it's also going to help you develop your skill set because the higher character you have and the more willing you are to do the hard things, the better off your skill is going to be and the closer you're going to reach your potential. So um, anyways, long-winded, long-winded finish for me on this one. It's just char character has been just forefront for me and what I've been developing in the background, what I've been talking about with my private clients, uh, what I've been talking about in the, on my platform about my hockey and the, and the parent group. And, uh, and I just, I mean, we just keep hearing it. I mean, I'm not making it up, right? I mean, here's what he is. Like I said, Tyler Wright, another director of scouting that just thinks Passion, competitiveness, and character are three of the biggest intangibles they look for. Uh, and it matters a lot to them. Rick Vibe was just talking about it. You I mean, we can go back and back through the podcast guests uh, about how important this is to people. Uh, yet nobody's really practicing it. Ask yourself how you're practicing it. How are you encouraging this as a coach? How are you encouraging this as a parent? How are you going about your day and about your week as a player? to make sure that you're trying to get the most out of yourself as a person. I think those are interesting questions to ask. And if you and if you aren't coming up with an actual process, that no, I, I am doing this. If you don't have an answer for that, then you're not doing it. And you're not doing enough of it. So find a way to do more of it. Um, that's my advice for the week. Hope everyone's doing awesome. Until next time, play hard, keep your head up.